Hello, and welcome to today's workshop, The Truth About Liver Cancer, produced by Blue Fairy, the Adrian Wilson Liver Cancer Association. My name is Andrea Wilson Woods, and I'm the president and founder of Blue Fairy. A nonprofit organization, Blue Fairy's mission is to prevent, treat, and cure primary liver cancer, specifically hepatocellular carcinoma, also known as HCC, through research, education, and advocacy. Today's workshop focuses on a topic near and dear to my heart, tough conversations. We're going to dive into shared decision-making, palliative care, and end-of-life discussions. And let me tell you, we have an incredible panel. I'm so excited for you to meet them. This specific workshop is sponsored by Genentech, a company that is committed to advancing science for the greater good. By tackling some of the world's most complex health challenges, Genentech knows that diversity and inclusion drive innovation. They develop and deliver medicines in an environmentally, economically, and socially responsible way. The ways they give back through their charitable giving, like with Blue Fairy, and through their employee time and talent have a powerful impact on their communities. Now, before we bring our first panelist to the stage, I want to tell you a little bit about the platform. This is called Crowdcast. This is very interactive. First of all, we have a chat and we encourage you to engage in the chat and talk to each other and respond to each other. We also have a poll. Now you may not see it. You're going to have to click on these little bars to your right there, but we would love to know how did you hear about today's event? So if you click on the little poll icon, you'll see it. We're going to leave this particular poll up for a while. Did you hear about it? I see one vote from Blue Fairy Communications, whether it was an email, a newsletter, or through our online community. Did you hear about today's event from a Facebook ad, or a Google ad, or even perhaps a Twitter ad? Did you hear about our event through social media post, organic post, not ads? Or did you hear about today's event from our sponsor, Genentech? Or perhaps none of those apply and you are in the other category. So please let us know how you heard about today's event, and we'll keep reminding you about this particular poll. And again, we're going to leave it up for just a little while. Also, I want to talk about Q&A. We're going to have an incredible, dynamic, interactive Q&A at the top of the hour. So if you have a question, instead of putting it in the chat, put it in the Q&A. You'll see a little question mark. I want you to click that, and that is where you can ask a question. And the beauty of that is other people can see your questions and they can upvote them. So when we get to the Q&A, if we have a lot of questions, we can focus on the ones that people want the answers to the most, but we will do our best to get to all the questions you may have. Now, let's get started. Let's bring our first panelist to the stage. Again, we have just an amazing panel. You guys are going to be blown away. Let's bring Dr. Arpan Patel to the stage. Dr. Patel is a hepatologist and doctorally trained health services researcher who practices within the UCLA and VA Greater Los Angeles healthcare systems. In addition to caring for his patients with liver disease and hepatobiliary cancers, he is dedicated to improving patient healthcare access and quality of care with a focus on palliative care. Dr. Patel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You're in such an incredible field. And of course, I have so many questions, but I always like to ask, did you always want to be a doctor? You know, I came from a family that had a lot of healthcare professionals, um, physicians, nurses, um, pharmacists. And so I think it was in my blood to some degree. Um, but, you know, moving into medical school and actually being there, my interest diverged from some other things that my family um, had been specializing in, but I always have carried um, the experience of having a chronic illness with me because I was surrounded by it so much growing up. Wow. Um, and did you start off specializing in liver disease? I actually got really interested in liver disease just all, all the way back from medical school. Um, I, I had a ton of experiences uh, with, with role models of hepatologists when I was seeing them in the hospital and that kind of just burgeon through residency and, and other parts of my training. And so um, just the idea of seeing physicians who were really compassionate about their patients was 
a little bit different for me and the field of hepatology compared to others. And um, some of those amazing role models are a big reason why I chose that field, but it started quite early for me. Wow. And I, I agree with you that the people who are in liver cancer are so passionate. They, they really are. So how did you go from specializing in liver disease to palliative care? So when I was in my training, I was noticing um, when you're in training, you t- tend to see more patients in the hospital initially than seeing them in the clinic setting. And that's where you see a lot of complications happening um, as a trainee. And what I was noticing many times when I was in the hospital, um, particularly was spe- specifically the liver transplant wards, um, was that there were many cases where people just wouldn't make it, unfortunately. And I found that... Um, you know, while while hepatology teams and these teams were so great at taking care of the physical needs of patients and under helping them, you know, navigate the treatment options for their for their liver disease, whether that's cancer or cirrhosis, I found that there were a lot of gaps in meeting some of their psychological needs, um, some of their caregiver needs, and a lot of their informational needs. And and that carried with me quite a while um, when I was in training, and I decided that. Um, palliative care is a way of sort of fulfilling that gap um, if integrated in the care of these patients. And it was something I just wanted to dedicate, you know, the rest of my career to because I felt it was something that was so needed. Wow. Gosh, I'm so thankful. And I I know you obtained your PhD in health policy um, because of that. To really um, set the groundwork for us, would you tell us how you define the difference between palliative care and hospice? Because I think there's, well, I know there's a lot of confusion. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I get asked this question all the time. Um, so you, palliative care um, can be defined in a few ways. But first way of thinking about it is just it's a form of care that, um, that prioritizes quality of life. And when I talk to patients about what palliative care is, they often are thinking about the palliative care team, you know, the mm. group of uh, doctors, uh, nurse practitioners, nurses, pharmacists, social workers, chaplains, who are uh, who are providing these needs that I was that I talked about that a lot of times that other other services are not providing. So the way I talk to patients about is that it's a it's a second second layer of comfort or an additional layer of support for you while you're going on your journey. Um, hospice, on the other hand, is a form of palliative care that's deliver to patients when there isn't as much time left. So usually in this country, that means six months or less. So you can get palliative care all throughout your disease trajectory. And hospice is typically a form of palliative care offered um, when there is less time left. So uh, you said something really interesting. Hospice in this country, typically your life expectancy is six months or less. Does it differ in other countries? Um, you know, actually, it's more the six month has to do with uh, the med- the Medicare benefit um, and just how that's structured. Um, in other countries, it can look pretty different. Um, I'm not sure if they have as much of a um, a month period, like six month period. So it's defined a little bit differently. But hospice in this country is defined by the insurance benefit and that period of time. Okay, that makes me so sad. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, I, I learned something new with every workshop, with, with every day I do. Um, going back to your PhD in health policy, did you deal with any pushback when you decided to focus your research on palliative care? Yeah, I think it's a really great question. You know, when I decided to embark on this journey of palliative care research, I think I was facing um, similar misperceptions that I might get from anyone, you know, whether that's whether that's patients, I was getting those misperceptions from my colleagues. Um, wow. A lot of my, my physician colleagues also, uh, unfortunately, conflate hospice to palliative care. So when I was initially saying I wanted to do palliative care research, they thought that meant that I just wanted to, you know, they they were making sort of hurtful comments saying that I just, you know, wanted patients to die and sort of experience. What? That. that was, that was, it was really hurtful initially to have to go through yeah. that. But slowly over time, I think we've changed some of the culture of, um, of, of liver disease specialists. Um, we've had guidelines now um, that are, that talk about palliative care delivery and cirrhosis and liver cancer. Um, and we also have many professional societies now endorsing it as part of care. So I think we've come a long way from where we started. Would you mind sharing how long ago that was? Because I have a feeling it wasn't that long ago. 2015. Oh, my God. That's awful. 
I yeah. thought you were going to say at least a decade ago, but <laughs> no. <laughs> um, oh my goodness. Um, I know that you actually created a group of researchers. Would you tell us about that? Yeah, you know, and when it comes to um, types of spaces where there aren't a lot of people doing research, I think in, in general, or even thinking about clinical care, it's important just to band together. So I actually started this uh, group. It's called the Pearl Group, um, which stands for Palliative Care Education, Advocacy, and Research in Liver Disease. And um, we're a small work group that um, that really started because I started cold emailing people. Um, basically, whenever someone had a publication or something on, I saw on social media or some uh, talk that I saw, I would just email them. And slowly we became a group of 15 to 20 researchers who do a lot of, um, a lot of different types of uh, studies, but also events and educational events across the country. And um, many of them were actually present on the formation of our ASLD guidelines. Wow. And we just dropped uh, a link to your research, a Dropbox link. Um, it's a folder with some of your research there. Thank you so much. Um, are there other disease spaces outside of liver disease and liver cancer that have made more headway with palliative care? Yeah, it's uh, it's a great question. I think much of the palliative care movement, um, which, which started initially with the hospice movement before palliative care, but a lot of that started with advanced cancer, but not necessarily GI cancers like HCC. It was mostly with uh, lung cancers and blood cancers. Um, palliative care is also becoming a lot more up and coming and important in cardiology and, and kidney disease um, and dementia. And so I think um, guidelines, professional guidelines, at least, as well as uh, patient advocacy groups, as well as you know many different community events have, have really been um, focusing on palliative care in those disease states for, for many times for decades. Um, and so I think that we're a little bit late to the game, but there is room for us to grow for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's been 22 years since my sister died and we went through her HCC journey and palliative care was never mentioned. Like those words, I never heard those. I don't think I even knew what they meant until a few years after she died. So it just never came up. Um, do you think the public perception of palliative care is changing at all? You know, while there is a lot more visibility of palliative care in the sense of we have hospitals now that have over 90% of hospitals have a palliative care team, not all wow. clinic, not all outpatient centers um, or specialty centers have outpatient palliative care teams, but as a field, palliative care has grown. However, um, we know from public surveys that the perception actually hasn't changed a whole lot too much, which is really interesting. So I think while we have more access, um, patients still may not, uh, at least, you know, people in the public may just not in general um, know exactly, like we said, the differences between palliative care and hospice care. Um, and they haven't shown too much more reception really either. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement. Yeah, gosh, and I hope, I hope this workshop really helps with that perception. And as a palliative care specialist, are you part of a liver cancer multidisciplinary team at UCLA? And where do you come in? So I do actually most of my clinical care at the Veterans Affairs Hospital, um, and I do research at UCLA. So I'm not as integrated in the liver cancer treatment team at um, UCLA, but at the, at the Veterans Affairs VA Hospital, I am. Um, and we've been doing a better and better job, I feel, over the past few years, trying to integrate palliative care teams as well as a palliative care focus to our approach to care, um, and we do we deliver things all the way to um, systemic chemotherapy. Really presenting the full range of options and transplant, we actually send um, to other centers, but we are obviously talking to patients about it too. So I'm I'm glad that at the VA we've been um, really integrating principles of palliative care a little bit more effectively. So it sounds like the VA is more palliative care oriented. Why is that? Yeah, it's actually a, l a large part of the history of the VA. Um, whole really? person care, wow. uh, patient centered care, veteran centered care have been a huge uh, part of um, the organization. And there's actually uh, leaderships and within the VA for palliative care that go all the way to DC. So I, I think that um, with that leadership for palliative care um, there, 
there's a lot of focus on integrating aspects of it throughout many different disease states. And now our liver disease work group that we have, the VA nationally also endorses palliative care for patients with liver disease. So, um, so I'm actually part of that, uh, one of the cirrhosis groups. Um, there's also a liver cancer group and we're actively making headway to try to integrate palliative care for those patients. So the VA is really setting an example, it sounds like. I, I think so. Wow. I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. Like, we all are. Um, so when you work with patients in the clinic, with, with, with these VA patients, um, how do you even start that conversation about palliative care? You know, first, I have to think to myself, am I being able to offer you know, the full spectrum of what I think a patient might need. And that can include, you know, their psychological support, their physical needs support, caregiver support, um, spiritual support. And sometimes patients don't have a high amount of needs initially, but a lot of times they do. Yeah. And so when I feel like I'm coming across my bandwidth, I tell the patient that, um, you know, have you heard of palliative care? And I, use, I first ask them, you know, have you heard of it before? Can you tell me a little bit about it? Get a sense of where they are with what it. What is the typical answer? You know, they think it, a lot of times people don't know what it is. The second answer people have are, I think it's when um, when I'm at the end of the line or when I'm at the end of the rope. And I try to, you know, share the definition I shared with you that they're an extra layer of support. And usually when I say that, there's a team that's going to be providing you an extra layer of support. People actually are a lot more receptive to it. I'm um, sure. I can imagine that part of it has to do with the fact that I've established a relationship with that patient. Maybe they trust me. Um but I do feel like once you sort of change and shift their focus to thinking of it as an extra layer of support, they're a lot more receptive to it. Why do you think, I mean, I, I think to some extent we're all afraid of dying. And, and what I like to say is we all have two things in common. We're all born and we're all going to die. You know, that the, the when of death is unknown, but, but we, it is going to happen. I, I know Jack Dorsey, former CEO of Twitter, believes he'll never die, but he might be the only exception. Um, why do you think it is that people are afraid to, to have this discussion, you know, and why? You know, I think that um, part of it is kind of what we have been talking about is just this, this fear of death. Um, and I think part of it is that maybe the recommendation might not be so strong. You know, I mm -hmm. think that when when patients are seeing multiple different treating teams, um, some of them might just be really focused on, let's get you to that next treatment. Let's get you yeah. to the next treatment. And um, it can feel like when you're talking not about cure, you're falling backwards. Um, but mm -hmm. I think I think what we know, many of us know as, as treating clinicians is that sometimes there's not a perfect answer. Right. You know, um, there's sometimes it's a lot of gray. And I think that when I find um, us entering the gray territory, that's when um, patients start to patients, and their families really start to then understand how misty it is. And so um, and, and maybe sometimes for the types of decisions they made before might regret them. So I think that um, I like to talk to patients early so that they feel prepared about things that might happen to them just to sort of off help them understand that at some point things are going to get gray. And yeah. I feel like that makes them a little bit more receptive to palliative care rather than this focus on, on just let's treat, let's treat, let's treat. Um, but I can understand the allure of that because that's something that is so present for people and upfront to them. And yet I have found in, in 20 years now with Blue Fairy that most of the time patients assume because their doctor gave them a drug, and this is even way before what we have available now to treat advanced HCC, patients assume it's curative and be, because their doctor was not direct with them about it and, and, and didn't really explain what palliative meant and what the goal of treatment was. Um, it sounds like the VA has really embraced palliative care. What about outside the VA, what do you think the experience is for patients with palliative care? I think it'd be a lot more, I think it's a lot more challenging. Um, I, I, you know, I can't speak of all the experiences just because I'm not a clinician um, who sees patients yeah. outside the VA, although I've been in, in that, that experience, I've been in that setting before. Um, I think it can get really challenging when the teams get complex, particularly. So um, let's say if you're thinking about liver transplant, you're seeing a radiologist, you're seeing an, you're seeing so many different doctors. Um, the the problem can be that if not everyone is on the same page with palliative care, then 
patients can often get mixed messages. Um, they kind of want everyone on the same page. And I, I don't think that's a problem that's necessarily unique to um, outside of the VA. I think that happens in the VA too. I just think that sometimes when patients are not in one healthcare system or they're seeing many people, often they're the quarterback. And yeah. it feels really overwhelming um, to them to have to put all these opinions together. And if one of those opinions is not saying palliative care, then it often feels like that's probably shouldn't be something that should be prioritized or those aspects of care. Yeah. For for patients who are more involved and to use the term in the medical community, more activated, what does this idea of shared decision making look like? I think it's a good question. I think um, for me, what shared decision making is, is incorporating uh, what's important most to a patient and their family in the decision plan. Um, we like to, again, more focus on um, things like mortality and death. But if we started to prioritize um, what makes uh, a patient have a good quality of life, what a good day looks like, their goals, their values, understanding the perspectives of their caregivers, how much burden they're, uh, in, they're, they're facing, these are just as important, if not as, as more important sometimes than um, how much time is left. For the treatments. And I think if we helped spend some time understanding what's important to patients and families about their experience as much as the cancer, we can often make good decisions um, that incorporate some of those aspects. I think what happens now, we're so focused on um, treating the tumor that we often forget about all of these other aspects of patients. And we just sort of go down the line and tell patients sometimes what to do. And they accept that because they're scared. And I think that, that that's a natural worry. And I think if we took a few steps back and, and got a little bit more of the puzzle pieces together, we can make a lot better decisions. Yeah, gosh, I agree. Uh, one last question for you until we bring you back for the Q&A. Tell us a little bit about your research and advanced care planning, because it's another topic I'm extremely passionate about. Yeah, so advanced care planning is a process that allows us to better understand goals and values for patients. Um, and in many cases, when we're able to do that, we can document um, some of those uh, decisions, some of those goals and values, as well as decisions about healthcare in a document. So I um, I do research in trying to understand why it doesn't happen as mm -hmm. much for, for individuals with liver disease. And while there are a lot of different barriers that you can imagine, um, a lot of my research focuses on making sure that patients really understand what to expect and understand their illness very well, because that could be a, a large barrier. But it can also be because um, clinicians and physicians don't recommend um, yeah. those types of those things like advanced care planning. And they sometimes are not clear how to communicate about it, too. And so a lot of my uh, research focuses on how do we improve communication between uh, clinicians and patients and their families about these topics and how do we get to the point that we can actually start documenting those things so that they can be used across healthcare systems. So that's what a lot of my research is in. I'm very passionate about um, good communication and, and shared decision making. So I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, I think, and I've heard this again more than once over the years, many, many times, a lot of physicians, their their way of talking about advanced care planning is get your affairs in order, and that's it. And that's not very helpful for patients at all. Um, you know, they don't know really where to go from there. Uh, Dr. Patel, your research is amazing. Um, we are going to send you back to the audience, but we are going to bring you back at the top of the hour for the Q&A. Um, thank you so, so much, and we'll see you shortly. Thank you for having me. We're now going to bring Dr. Sarah Bauer to the stage. Sarah C. Bauer, MD, MS, is a developmental and behavioral pediatrician. Her father had type 2 diabetes and experienced a short battle with stage 4 hepatocellular carcinoma. Her personal advocacy interests include improved education and screening guidelines for liver disease and diabetes. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Andrea. Before we talk about your father's journey, um, tell us a little bit more about your career because you are a doctor. Sure, sure. So I am a developmental behavioral pediatrician. So my clinical practice focuses on 
uh, children with developmental differences, particularly autism. And so I spend a lot of time in that space and then also working in um, just similar, I was, uh, similar to what Dr. Patel said, access is big in the world that we live in. So I think that's a big conversation that's um, on my mind on a daily basis. Got it. Now, would you take us back to the beginning with your father? Because I know this was fairly recent. Yeah, so my father's journey actually started after around the holidays last year. So December 2022, um, he had just a routine Medicare physical with his primary care doctor. And it was noted that he had an elevated AST. Um, all the other labs were totally within normal limits and his primary care doctor followed up on that, um, made some modifications to his medication. Um, and then ultimately the numbers kept climbing over the next few weeks. And so that resulted in an ultrasound. The ultrasound noticed uh, noted multiple nodules on his liver. He had a CAT scan that showed um, pervasive involvement um, in his liver and then also some possibilities within his lungs that were later confirmed to be metastases closer to his to his passing. Um, and then it all started from there. So he was diagnosed uh, on Tuesday, March 14th, 2023, and he passed away on Friday, May 12th, 2023. Oh, God, I'm so sorry for your loss, Sarah. And I thank you so much for, for being here today. Uh, prior to your father's physical, how was he feeling? Yeah, and forgive me if I get a little emotional, but... Um, it's okay. All right. It hits you at unexpected times. I thought I was totally fine today. So um, he was doing really well. You know, I have to say he was driving up to probably two weeks before he got sick, like really sick. He's very involved in a local food pantry as part of his retirement. And um, then he was doing very well. Um, I would say the symptom that looking back, and I'm going to bring my mom up a lot because I think that she and I have had this conversation a lot. And so like when I'm talking today, I'm also representing my dad's story, but particularly hers um, as she was right there with him the whole way. Um, he had pretty, he had reflux that just wasn't getting better. Um, and I think that he, and actually up to the very end, he never had pain, um, but had reflux that kind of just didn't get better. Yeah. Um, I, that was one of the only symptoms my sister had. She was yeah. chewing Tums like they were candy. And yeah. I just felt like as her parent, I could control what she ate at home, but I couldn't control what she ate at school or outside yeah. the house. And and I, you know, my attitude was just stop eating tacos. I mean, I, you know, I, just, <laughs> I didn't know what it was, but, um, but she had a yeah. lot of acid reflux for probably two full months before she was yeah. diagnosed. And she of course was metastatic as well. Um, I find it really interesting. I, I want to circle back, um, be, because I, I ask about this all the time. Most primary care physicians don't test for liver enzymes and it's a very mm -hmm. for simple metabolic panel. Um, why did the doctor test for that? You know, I think he's, my dad has, and my dad had a fantastic primary care doctor. And I think that he just checked those as part of an annual physical. And that's what we found. So wow. I would give a lot of credit to him. And he's ultimately who kind of led us, led my dad to the diagnosis and gave it to him. Yeah. Did they ever detect any underlying liver disease? Yeah. So after my dad's death, you know, I, I spoke to his his primary care doctor about sort of like what the biopsy showed, like if it showed any, yeah. you know, any fatty liver disease or anything like that, nothing. It was nothing. <laughs> wow. No, his hepatitis, no uh, Wilson's disease, which is incredibly rare. Um, yeah. Nothing. nothing. Wow. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah. How easy or difficult was it for you to get a first and second opinion. You said you're the primary care physician kind of led that charge. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I would say the process was a whirlwind. You know, I think um, the primary care, his primary care doctor um, gave guidance for the first opinion and was very supportive of my dad getting second and third opinions. And this all started actually after the CAT scan and before the, res before the biopsy, um, because at first it was sort of this tumor of unknown you know, etiology. Like we didn't know yeah. quite what it was. We thought it could be METs from some met metastases from something else. 
um, he led that. And then for the second opinion, um, I don't, I think my experience might be different than others, but I called everybody I knew. So I think that I, uh, and ultimately who really guided us was a former attending of mine when I was in medical school, um, who was just an outstanding um, advocate for, for helping us know who to go to and where, and that's how we got the second opinion. And I think we were really lucky to get that. And I think we were very lucky to get in as quickly as we did. And really my dad just called and said, hi, my name is Don Bauer. I need a second opinion for liver cancer. So that's all he did, Aww. you know? And um, so I think the second, the, the folks who gave the second opinion were also very helpful. Did the doctors ever try to give your father a timeline of any kind? Oh, what an interesting question. Um, my mom and I were actually talking about this this morning. Um, and no, um, my dad specifically asked during the second opinion. Um, and I was, I would listen in on the convert. I was there by phone for those conversations. And um, my dad asked and uh, he was advised that I don't like to give, uh, as a physician, they didn't like to give timelines. They, right. the repeated language that was used in the, with my dad in this outpatient stage was it's treatable, not curable. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what my dad mentally was preparing for, which was like, I'm not going to get better from this. Maybe this is a chronic illness that is going to be very serious. I mean, I think he knew it was serious. I, I don't mean to, I think he knew it was very serious. I certainly do not think he knew it was less than two months. Yeah. Given that it was so serious and, and what was seen on, on the multiple imaging that was done, what was the recommended treatment? Um, so the recommended treatment was immunotherapy. Um, and so after he saw the first uh, oncologist, he scheduled that. So he scheduled that for April 18th. And um, in the midst from the time he was diagnosed on the 14th till the 18th, when that was scheduled, he got a second opinion. He also, um, enrolled in a study at that time and they were trying to see if Y90 was going to be an option for him. Um, because of the extensive involvement, he was not determined to be a candidate for Y90 infusions. Um, and he got the treatment on the 18th of the one round of immunotherapy. And what happened with my dad was, we ended up, we um, were encouraged and we already had had a family vacation planned and we were encouraged to go by multiple uh, people in the healthcare uh, field. Um, my dad asked, even my mom said later, he asked the day before we went. Um, we were all nervous about it. I think my mom particularly, um, but he was insistent and we ended up going down to uh, a favorite vacation spot. Uh, when we got down there, his decline was rapid. So what ended up happening is woke up in the middle of the night one night and said, we got to, I said, we, I, we can't, we have to go home. Um, we started driving home, um, realized he wasn't going to make it to that point. Um, Googled a trauma center, um, pulled over in the middle of rural South Carolina. Um, and my dad was then diagnosed with bilateral pneumonia, um, went into hepatorenal syndrome, a few days later and he died that Friday. So um, a pretty rapid story and a whirlwind. And it also occurred, you know, away from our home and uh, our home. So, yeah, yeah. I, I'm so sorry, but I'm also so glad he got to go on that vacation. Yeah. And I think it, you know, my mom has shared um, that, I mean, we were all sort of holding on for dear life with this vacation, but also knew that that was an important event for us to go on as a family. Um, but I also think that my dad wanted to give that to us and he traveled his whole life as part of his, his work and his career. And um, so there was some bittersweet symmetry and him dying on the road. No, oh, I don't think I knew that part. Oh, yeah. wow. What was your experience like with the palliative care team and prior to your prior to your dad, what experience did you have um, as a doctor? Yeah, so I think uh, our experience, uh, the physician who diagnosed my, I think my mom knew before. My mom 
instinctively knew he was leaving us, you know, um, and the physician who said, who diagnosed him with hepatorenal syndrome was like, you know, I, I don't have any tricks up my sleeve for this, Sarah. Um, and I appreciate his candor, his honesty. And he said, I think we need to switch. The word was comfort care. Um, and I said, let's get everybody on board that we can. I think my dad, I think what we wanted at that point, um, at that point, my my husband, my sister, my niece had gone back home to Chicago and my mom and I stayed back with my dad. And when that shift happened, we asked them to come home or to come back to South Carolina. Um, and the palliative care team, I think, was just uh, a godsend to us. They're just an absolute godsend. I think the, the chaplains, the nurses, the physicians, um, I am forever grateful for what they did for my dad and our family. What I'm so glad to hear that, first of all. Um, mm -hmm. Second of all, prior to that, did you have any training in palliative mm -hmm. care when you were going through med school? I did. I think I, I actually was, I migrated to those types of rotations and I migrated towards those types of conversations. So that's not something that I was ever afraid of or, um, and in the work I do now, I certainly um, do not have conversations with families about death, but I do have difficult conversations with families about when their child is developing in a way that they did not anticipate, expect, or know what to do with. So I think that having somebody who's willing to, I say that because I think what this work is and what, you know, being on both sides of it in different elements, I think that I know that it's in the gray and I know that there's resources out there and I know you have to ask for them sometimes. And I think what Dr. Patel mentioned in terms of like patients quarterbacking, I realized on the middle of the road in the South Carolina that we were on our own and we were going to do this the way was right for my dad. Um, and uh, that was liberating in some ways, but it was also terrifying. And when we somehow landed at the healthcare center that we did, we were so blessed in so many ways. And I think that to back to your original question, um, Andrea, is that I think I, um, I did and I'm glad I did because I wasn't afraid of asking for it. Um. I know after your father's service, you read a book. Would you mind sharing what that book is and how mm -hmm. it impacted you? It's interesting. So this isn't a new book, right? So Being Mortal by Atul Gawande. And I think that um, prior to my dad's death, I think I didn't read that book because I was afraid of my parents' mortality. Um, after, I know it's an inevitable part of all of our journeys and how lucky was I to have the dad I did. In the time I did with him. But um, what struck me about it was that the conversations that, like what he experienced as a physician when his dad, as a physician, was going through a terminal illness and a diagnosis and what that is resonated with me on so many levels. Like, what do you want? What is, what's important to you? How do you want to spend your time? And I'm paraphrasing, I'm certainly not direct quoting here, but. Um, I wish those questions had been asked of my dad. I don't know if my dad would have had the language to say it. He was a pretty stoic guy. Um, he was a pretty stuff it, suck it up and do it. And <laughs> we're going to be fine kind of guy. Um, and I think this, uh, this certainly knocked the wind out of his sails. But, um, but I wish that those questions would have been asked so at least he had the chance to respond if he could. And I think my mom has said that too. Like, you know, I think we strong. Everybody in my family strongly believes that my dad's decision that we were going to South Carolina, no matter what, was his decision of uh, the last decision that he could make to give to us and be together in a favorite place. But um, those life moments of, do you want to go under? Do you want to have a infusion of immunotherapy? Because I do think that's what led to his his rapid, I mean, not only the disease burden of the tremendous disease burden that he had, but um, I think the um, decision of, do I even want to go through it? Yeah. 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 There's a, um, a great quote. That's one of my favorite books and um, what doctors will do for themselves. They will not do for patients. And it's so true. I believe that. So, yeah. <laughs> um, 
Where do you think that comes from? Oh, it's a good question. I think I apply what I would do for myself to my my family when we have, I mean, I think we've had, my family's had a lot of these conversations in the past months, like um, my 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 nuclear family of five at this point, you know, I think we've had a lot of these, like, what would you want? What do you want to do? So I think maybe that's a gift my dad gave us. Yeah. But I think that if I apply it to what experience my dad had, he only met his oncologist once, once, right? So do you go straight to that conversation? Would I go straight to that conversation with a family on the first visit when you had just started treatment? I don't know, because you want to have a relationship with them before you go right to it. And my dad's trying to figure out, like, do I want to do, like, is this yeah. the right person for me? But I'm terrified. I mean, Dr. Patel saying, like, you know, you know you're know, you scared. Of course you're scared, right? Like, so you're going to do what they tell you. And a lot of our education about HCC has been in retrospect, right? And so I think that um, to your point, I think some of that is relationship, right? I think it's relationship with that person, developing that trusting relationship. But in these situations, you don't have a lot of time. And I think if I knew we didn't have a lot of time with my dad, but I certainly didn't know it was eight weeks, you know? Yeah. The very first pediatric oncologist we had for my sister told us to go to Hawaii and which was really, which was really odd because she had never expressed a desire to go to Hawaii. Um, I, it was so out of, it was so random. And, um, but, I, but I can, again, retrospectively, like you look back and say, oh, okay, that was his way of telling yeah. us she was dying and, and that he couldn't do anything for her. Um, you, you know, but at the time it just, it, it didn't strike the right nerve. You know, it was really, it felt very insensitive at the time. Um, and I wish he could have been a little more honest about what was going on. Um, one last question. Um, that particular pediatric oncolog oncologist we fired. <laughs> so, but um, we had really great experiences with the nurses. What was it like dealing with the oncology nurses? So I'll speak to the nurses we had during my dad's hospitalization. So he was hospitalized on a Tuesday and then died, you know, that uh the 12th. So about a little bit over a week. Um, I don't know what we would have done without them. You know, I think that particularly my dad was every nurse we had at the medical center where he passed away was, um, just an angel disguised as a human. To us. <laughs> you know, I think they were willing to be with us when it was like super uncomfortable. I mean, I felt like people would walk by our room and sort of gives us these, we feel sorry for you looks, you know, that I know I've given to people like, oh gosh, this is so sad. This is so awful. And, but I think that I'll speak to what happened in the, you know, my dad's process of dying was rapid. You know, I think that, um, and after he died, we were all with him at that moment. And when he took his last breath, <laughs> okay. take your time. And they stayed with him and never left him, even when he had to go down to the morgue. And for that, I'm so grateful. Sarah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Um, the gift that I'll never forget. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, please, uh, we're going to have you back at the top of the hour or just after the top of the hour for our Q&A. Thank you so much for, for sharing your father and your mother's story and your story. Um, we, we so appreciate it. And, and speaking of oncology nurses, we're going to bring one to the stage right now. Thank you for having me and listening. <laughs> so Ryan Wilson, DNP, RN, OCN, is a clinical assistant professor at the University of Minnesota School of Nursing. He is a trained systems thinker with extensive experience in care coordination, case management, interprofessional healthcare leadership, health policy, and advocacy. He received his Bachelor of Science in Nursing with a concentration in Leadership Studies from Western Kentucky University 
and his Doctor of Nursing Practice from the University of Minnesota, specializing in health innovation and leadership. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. No, oh, thank you for having me. And I am also so emotional and I'm so um, proud to be a nurse in this moment hearing Sarah's story. So um, thank you for sharing, Sarah. And um, I'm very happy to be here. Did you always want a career in healthcare? You know, um, no. Whenever I first started my undergraduate uh, degree, um, I was planning to go into something like PR or marketing or something like that. And <laughs> I took a couple of courses and they weren't really, they weren't really for me. Um, but my mom is a nurse and mm -hmm. um, has been a nurse, you know, her entire career. And uh, kind of inspired me to look more into what nursing was all about, because frankly, I didn't know what a nurse did or what their role was. Um, so uh, I looked into the program at the school at Western Kentucky and um, it was pretty well um, known for its nursing program. So I decided to shift my prerequisites and um, <laughs> take the leap of faith. And here I am. So it turned out well. When you were going through nursing nursing school, what rotations did you have and, and how did you get into oncology specifically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have uh, rotations. You're kind of trained as a generalist. So, you know, you, you work with um, older adults all the way to, to newborns in the NICU. Um, and I wasn't really sure where I was going to go, but people would frequently ask me, um, what kind of nurse do you want to be here? What kind of specialty <laughs> do you want to work in? And I frankly, I didn't really know what they meant by that. So one <laughs> night I uh, curiously went to the, the library and just Googled nursing specialties. <laughs> and it turned I out that the first story. thing that showed up at the top, yeah, the first thing that showed up at the top was oncology nursing, the oncology nursing society, which is our professional organization. And I was like, hmm, uh, this sounds interesting. Um, so I had an opportunity to uh, sign up for a, an internship, uh, kind of like a nursing aid position at the local uh, community hospital and was placed on the oncology unit. Um, and ever since then, um, the experiences I had there just really solidified my um, interest in Mary. Maybe it was just serendipity that I, that I ended up there, but it certainly has been the right career for me. That also tells me that the Oncology Nursing Society must have um, great SEO. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right? If they showed right. Up they're, the they're buying the right ads. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I want to sh uh, shout out to them because the Oncology Nursing Society is what led us to you. So, mm -hmm. um, so I'm yeah. very grateful. Um, so, what was that like when you were in nursing school and you were you're working with patients? Yeah, um, the it wasn't a requirement to have this kind of internship or this um, direct care experience. You get that through kind of your clinical training as well. But um, I found it, found it so valuable because you really got to learn um, the things that you don't really learn in the classroom, like how to talk to people and the context of healthcare and understanding um, that people are coming from all different places. And this is a very scary moment for them. And while this might be our day to day, this might be the very first time they've ever had this type of interaction. And then you put a layer on top of that in terms of cancer care and kind of the, the context around what it means to take care of somebody with a serious illness like that, uh, particularly in an inpatient setting where oftentimes the folks that are there are pretty ill yeah. um, and in pretty dire straits most of the time. It's very unusual that we have to give chemotherapy in the hospital anymore on a routine basis. The people that are in the hospital nowadays are those that are pretty ill. Uh, yeah. generally speaking. So um, that experience um, really helped me, you know, feel like I was, you know, in the right place. Um, early in your career, did you ever have to take part in difficult conversations or deliver difficult news yourself? Yeah, interesting. Um, there were um, several patients that we had on the units that would come in for their chemotherapies, um, particularly those with like uh, some sort of acute leukemia, leukemias or something like that. And so we would build relationships with with folks. And I, what comes to mind is a gentleman um, that we had been taking care of for a few months. And um, the oncologist um, had gotten his report back from his bone marrow biopsy and um, it wasn't great. It wasn't good news. Right. So yeah. Um, I had never been a part of a conversation like that. 
And so I had asked the oncologist, would you mind if I just kind of went in with you? And I know this gentleman, we have a good relationship and I want to be supportive of him. Um, but I'm also interested to know kind of how this is going to go, because frankly, in school, you don't really learn a whole lot about, about that or have experiences with that. Um, and while the conversation was really difficult, uh, it really reframed my idea about what it means to care for people. Yeah. Um, that people are not room 234 with leukemia, that he was, you know, his Bob and, you know, he had a family and he had a, a background and a history. And those serious conversations where you're delivering tough news really brings in the humanity around um, healthcare. And um, yeah, I think those, those conversations uh, really have helped me kind of put into context that. I just want to give you a big giant A, men. <laughs> I just love the way you phrase that. Um, you mentioned that you, during your formal training, you weren't really given that opportunity. There wasn't an actual, um, th there wasn't actual courses per se, right? Do you think mm -hmm. there should be more formal training on how to deliver very difficult news to patients and their families? Yeah, you know, definitely. Um, and I think... Um, there's two sides to that. There's one side that is how to tactfully, how to respectfully, how to humanely really have right. these conversations with people. There's also the other side because we're humans too. Healthcare workers are humans too. And delivering difficult news to people over and over again can have wear and tear on your own moral fabric, if you will. Yeah. And so it's a balance of how to tactfully and humanely give uh, difficult news to people, but also take care of yourself to build community with people that are around you that are going through similar situations where they're having to give difficult news. Oftentimes that's your coworkers or your interprofessional yeah. colleagues. Um, and so, you know, it's that balance. And I, I don't think that we talk about that enough, at least in, in nursing spaces, um, those two sides. What is it like, and I'm just reflecting my own experience with that first pediatric oncologist I mentioned with Sarah. Um, the nurse was amazing. And, and so I'm wondering, what is it like when you've worked with doctors who just don't have the same level of compassion that you do? Sure. Um, it can be difficult, but I think about the importance of teamwork. The reason that we have interprofessional teams in healthcare is to help um, balance each other's skills and maybe gaps. And so I've worked with many physicians that in my opinion, weren't really great at giving uh, difficult news or maybe we were a little um, less humane, we'll say, about giving that. But then I saw that as an opportunity, as a responsibility for me to kind of fill that other side. And so there would often be times where I might be um, with a patient. Most of my career has been in case management and kind of care coordination. So when a patient would call the, the nurse line, I'm the one that answers the phone, right? Right. just for context. So I would be with uh, the providers that I would work with. And, and one provider in particular, maybe, you know, I know isn't going to give the news in the way that I would have wanted it to be given. Yeah. But then once the conversation's over and the physician walks out of the room, I usually would stay after and just kind of leave space and just say, how did that go? How are you feeling? What other questions do you have right now? And if you don't know what they are, guess what? Here's my business card and you can call me anytime you need to to talk to me about those questions. So um, Sarah had mentioned that she only got, that her father only got to meet his oncologist one time. Yeah. And that's what I mean, that the nurse really can play that role in filling that gap, that questions and misunderstandings can happen in the clinic. And that's why we need to continue to have conversations even after the clinic visit is over. And the nurse plays a really critical role in that. And so that's how I viewed my responsibility whenever I felt like maybe the provider wasn't giving the news in the way that I would have wanted it to be given. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, 22 years later, I'm still in touch with some of the pediatric nurses who treated my sister. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. That's how special they, they, they were and are. The theme of this workshop is tough conversations. And so I would like to know what does shared decision-making mean to you with that, that term? Yeah. So, Shared decision making for me is about defining what it is that the patient that is important to the patient and their family. To look at the options that we have ahead of us in terms of 
treatment plans or types of care that they're going to receive, maybe, um, you know, referrals that we might need to make, depending on the context of the situation. And then coming together as a fuller group, as a full right. team, including the patient and the family to really talk about how do these decisions that we're going to make align with the priorities that the patient and the family have. And um, it's not, that sounds very simple and a very easy thing to do, no, but it not. takes more time. And it's, yeah, yeah exactly. And it's, it's not, simple. and it's a continuous conversation, right? The priorities change in people's lives as we continue to go through these journeys. So it's continual. Um, iterative process of decision making as as the context of the situation continues to change. Um, so it's a difficult thing to do. It takes more time to do that, to do that well. But at the end of the day, the experience that the person is going to have and really how we feel in terms of our satisfaction with our jobs and our roles is really dependent on that core relationship and shared decision making. Yeah. Yeah. You made me think of something. Um one of our favorite nurses told me uh, at the time that um, everybody loved my sister, but a lot of the doctors could not stand me because I was just that I was the sister that asked too many questions. And I was like, that's okay. Like, I'm not there to be liked. I'm right. there to advocate for what she wanted. You know, mm. um, yep. you, you know, you talked about families and patients. Did you ever witness situa situations where what the family wanted differed from what the patient wanted? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that ties into this idea that it's not a simple thing um, yeah. to have shared decision making, especially when you have multiple people with different priorities. So yeah, um, there are many times, unfortunately, that families and caregivers might have different priorities than what the patient has. Um, and that can be a really tricky thing to try and navigate as a healthcare provider. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think it really is about um, putting the patient at the center, but also acknowledging that the patient doesn't live in isolation, right? They have their caregivers and their caregivers care about them. And so how do we have these conversations that bring up everybody's priorities? And then we can kind of talk through how we, how we shift through that. Um, so yeah, I, family members can be wonderful advocates uh, in most situations, but there can be times where there is some uh, some conflict there. You know, families come to us with decades and decades yes. of experiences with one another and stories, right? And so there could be long rooted, deep rooted issues between family members that we aren't gonna be able to solve in, in this moment in their right. life. Um, so we have to figure out a way to, to kind of get through that together. Yeah. Um I have one last question for you. At, at what point do you initiate that end of life discussion? Yeah, it depends on the context of the person's clinical situation, really. Um, but I don't think it's ever inappropriate to ask people when they're faced with a serious illness like cancer, regardless of the stage of their cancer, what is important to you? And, and what, do you, what do you want to prioritize as we kind of go through this, right? Are there really, um, you know, minute details like there's a trip that I want to go on with my family. So how do we build the treatment plan around prioritizing that versus, you know, more broader things like, you know, I've lived a great life and living 10 more years is not important to me. What's right. important to me is having good quality time with the family for the time that I have left. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's kind of what I think about. Yeah. Oh, and that's, that's so true. And, and, and um, where you are in your life, the age you are can make such a huge difference and in, in, in what it is you value most in that moment. Um, Brian, thank you so much for giving your perspective as an oncology nurse. Um, don't go very far. We're going to bring you back for the Q and A. So I'm going to send you back to the audience right now. Thanks. And we're going to bring Dr. Deneng Lee up to the stage. Dr. Lee is an associate professor and leads the Liver Cancer Collaborative Program within the Department of Medical Oncology and Therapeutics Research at the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center. Through innovative clinical trials ranging from novel immunotherapy, cellular therapy, and patient assessments, Dr. Lee focuses on improving the lives of patients with liver cancer. Dr. Lee has authored articles on liver cancer published in peer-reviewed journals, such as the New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet Oncology, and JAMA Oncology. 
Dr. Lee is also this year's recipient of the Blue Fairy Award, which acknowledges providers and researchers who are doing really innovative work in HCC. Dr. Lee, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, it, it's a true honor to you know be here today with my uh, fellow colleagues. Um, I love to ask, did you always want to be a doctor? Yeah, so um, like Dr. Patel, uh, I think you know medicine did uh, you know run through my family uh, as well. So my mother was an infectious disease physician as well, um, and my father was a neurosurgeon actually, and but both in China. So wow. early on, <laughs> uh, as I was growing up, I always you know had a piece of medicine. Uh, there was a moment in college where I thought you know maybe I would go into law, but uh, you know ultimately medicine won out. <laughs> uh, when you were in medical school, what drew you to your specialty? So I, I think I always wanted to do oncology, um, really? you know, uh, because it, oncology is very personal to me. Um, so I, I had uh, three grandparents uh, that, that, that had, you know, various different types of cancers. And I remember when I was here in the United States, when we emigrated here to the United States, um, my grandfather had just you know passed away uh shortly afterwards uh with uh colon cancer so so for me uh, a vivid moment uh i would say in my life was you know sitting on the porch and remembering just uh you know how, how, how sad that was and everything and that that you know as a child I, I wasn't able to do anything i wasn't able to be there um and that was really important to me um so i i knew from that moment that I wanted to do something with oncology, whether it was surgical oncology or medical oncology. And ultimately, um, I, I did play sports as well and injured my knee. So I knew I couldn't withstand <laughs> the, you know, 12 hour surgical oncology cases. And, and so I went into medical oncology. Oh, I got, so standing on your uh, feet for 12 hours yeah, during surgery yeah. wasn't going to be an option. I, I sure, got it. Sure. Um, I, I'm so sorry for your loss. My, my very first death in the family, I was seven. It was my grandfather from lung cancer. And I've now, counting my sister, lost six family members to five different cancers on every side of my family. So I'm just sort of surrounded by it. How did you end up focusing specifically on GI oncology? I specifically focus on GI oncology. I, I remember this also very vividly. So I did my um, uh, hematology oncology fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City. And I remember, you know, trying to decide my specialties and what I realized initially at that time point was I, I had done research, you know, somewhat in terms of uh, breast cancer and also done, you know, so some research uh, and had some experience in terms of leukemia uh, up to that moment. But then I realized that I really wanted to go into GI oncology because I really wanted to make a difference. Uh, one, one of the reasons I want, went into medicine was that I felt that it was a career where I could have a potentially an immediate impact on someone's uh, life uh, uh, and directly touch them. So while I appreciated my experiences, for example, in breast oncology, at that moment, I realized that there were a lot of various different types of treatments for uh, you know, our, our breast cancer patients, and they were living very long, and, and I was very appreciative of that. Uh, but when I saw GI oncology, I, I realized that there weren't any you know, major therapies at that point uh, for many types of GI cancer. So specifically, I said, hey, let me go in here because if I can, you know, help uh, to develop either novel therapeutics or um, various different types of ways to better treat our patients, uh, that would have a larger impact immediately on the lives of those patients. So, so, so that's the reason why I did that. Well, we are incredibly thankful and and you're so right this is where you can make a huge impact especially since hcc has um has not decreased and just continues to increase not just in the us but but worldwide um the trajectory is is really scary was palliative care part of your medical training so uh, as a uh, trainee and you know, medical oncology and everything, they definitely do incorporate, you know, palliative care because they realize that um, there will come uh, a, a point where we're not necessarily uh, able to, you know, potentially treat the cancer, uh, but we can still treat the individual, right? And, and that's very important. And we can always do that and everything. And that never ends and everything. So, so that's really a uh, important, you know, aspect of that. 
And I would say, you know, for me, it went a little bit beyond that. So, so I was mentored uh, by a, um, uh, a uh, amazing mentor, Dr. Arthi Hurya, who tragically passed away uh, a few years ago in the field of geriatric oncology. And, and I think that really instilled in me the additional sense and, and the value of palliative care that, uh, like you said, you know, uh, older adults particularly might have, you know, differences, uh, but they might have differences not due to just their chronologic age and everything, but they might have differences due to, you know, what is surrounding them, whether it's different social support, their own functional status and everything. And all of that is really involved in, in, in terms of palliative care, in terms of how we support our patients and, and to look beyond uh, necessarily just the cancer, but also the impact of the cancer on the symptoms, as well as how someone uh, essentially lives day to day and everything. And, and I think I draw on that experience in terms of, you know, how I approach our patients with liver cancer as well. Wow. Um, when you're meeting with a patient and you know right away the patient's not going to be eligible for a curative measure, measure like transplant or surgery, how do you? initiate those conversations with them? Sure. I, I mean, I think those are, uh, you know, still uh, uh, tough conversations, uh, even as you have more and more experience with this and everything, that the, the, they, they never get easier and everything. But I think the idea that I try to bring, at least into my clinic, is that um, it's really important to have that trusting relationship with your physician. Uh, and, and the the trust between a patient and the physician is ultimate. Um, so I really have that honest discussion uh, from, from, from the very beginning. I, I don't shy away from that. And I usually tell my patients that, you know, if, you know, this style might not be for you and everything, yeah. then it might not be the right fit uh, overall, but, but I do owe that to you and everything. Um, so I think it's really having that, you know, kind of upfront uh, discussion to earn their trust and uh, as well, and really say that the goal of treatment in that scenario as a medical oncologist in terms of the systemic therapies I'm providing is really to control the growth of tumors as long as we can, uh, as best as we can. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that you know, there's a uh, kind of a doomsday scenario in, in essence, right? Uh, I think what we've been able to see in liver cancer and, and particularly with HCC is that we've made dramatic advances. Um, so, so I tell my patients that while the statistics in terms of the fact that we've been able to improve on those statistics is still somewhat, somewhat sobering, um, numbers are numbers. Uh, right. but, 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 but people are definitely people. And there are individuals that come through my clinic who are now, uh, having received, you know, prior, uh, you know, systemic therapy, and have been off of systemic therapy and have a, had a dramatic response to their treatment where their cancer hasn't necessarily disappeared, but they're living with their cancer and the cancer is not growing at all on follow-up scans and everything. And they're now well over five or six years out from the initial time of treatment. So, yeah. so those are Amazing. real individuals. Yeah, the yeah, absolutely real individuals that are living their lives and everything. Um, and, and we don't just necessarily follow the numbers. Uh, we're honest about the numbers. Uh, but at the end of the day, we can't specifically just follow the numbers. My sister was diagnosed. I was, someone recommended I read Love, Medicine, and Miracles by Dr. Bernie Siegel. And I reached out to him and he responded right away. Um, I think this is before most people were emailing. So maybe I got lucky, but that was what he told me that, um, that people are people and they're not numbers and, and to not pay attention to the numbers. And it was, it, it meant a lot to me. It, it really did. Um, do you find that having a specific goal benefits a patient's mindset, like Sarah's father wanted to go on this vacation with his family? Absolutely. I, I think goals are, you know, so important. And what I try to do when I see my patients is try to ask them about their goals. Um, so, you know, I, I had a recent patient who uh, unfortunately, you know, passed away after four years uh, battling uh, uh, advanced liver cancer. Um, but the first thing that I got was a card that showed all of the different uh, pictures of critical events that we were able to achieve for him uh -huh. in the past four years, uh, whether it was attending a granddaughter's 
uh, you know, graduation, taking a trip yeah. uh, internationally, or uh, just being able to make it to different birthdays and weddings and events and everything. Uh, those were so pivotal. And, and that's what they were appreciative of, uh, of, you know, throughout all of our treatments and everything. So I think this really does matter. Uh, and, and this is the drive that keeps patients, you know, going, because I, I think, you know, a lot of times, uh, again, with, with, with our treatments, there there's going to be, you know, good days as well as hard days and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have those goals, ultimately, and, and keep that in mind, I think that really helps to keep that drive going. And, and that really helps our patients to really have, you know, what I truly believe to have the best outcomes. Yeah. Um, do you work with palliative care specialists like Dr. Patel? Yeah, so 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 we do. So so I I think um, you know what we're fortunate here at City of Hope is that we have you know several supportive care or palliative care you know specialists in our uh, department of supportive care. Um, so I know that that resource is not everywhere, um, but at, at least at our center uh, we have several individuals. So so as a result of that we really view the palliative care physicians from day one as part of our multidisciplinary team. So, so when we, when we always talk about a multidisciplinary team uh, in, in, H in HEC, we can think about, you know, medical oncology, surgical oncology, interventional radiology, gastroenterology. Uh, but for us, you know, palliative care is part of our uh, multidisciplinary team because I know that many of my patients will have symptoms very early on at the time of initial diagnosis with advanced HCC. Uh, and, and therefore, we have no problem referring them immediately for palliative care and tell them that, you know, palliative care is really going to help us to, uh, you know, support you and help to better control the symptoms of your illness, along with the treatments that we're providing, specifically targeting the cancer. Um, so, you know, I think that's something that I've been really fortunate uh, to have at our institution. Uh, that's something that our institution puts, uh, you know, a priority on and everything. Um, and, and so I think that's really important. Do you feel that patients, the ones you see, typically understand the difference between palliative care and hospice? Um, I think in the beginning, it can be challenging. Um, you know, I, I think everyone comes from very, you know, different backgrounds uh, in, in terms of what they know uh, with this. So what we always, you know, try to do is try to explain this uh, to them. So, so like what Dr. Patel said, um, you know, what we try to emphasize that, you know, palliative care can happen at any time in terms of uh, your um, uh, diagnosis journey. Uh, and it's really meant to support your symptoms. And, uh, you know, if you have, let's say, additional uh, times where you have to come to the hospital for an emergency, that's okay. Uh, but hospice is really then, you know, going probably one step further where we're potentially transitioning and focusing our priority, not necessarily just controlling the disease, but really prioritizing comfort above everything else. So, so in that scenario, if you got really sick, for example, you wouldn't necessarily come back to the hospital uh, and, uh, you know, have all of these, you know, invasive testing that, that, that that's done because you're prioritizing comfort uh, above everything else. So I think when we explain that, you know, to our patients, they get a really good understanding of what each is and everything. Uh, and, and just like what everyone has said on this um, uh, event so far, um, I think that really makes a difference because patients have to understand that uh, to, to, to know then how to prioritize different values at different events during their treatment journey. Yeah, I, I agree. And for those who don't know, I lived in Southern California over 20 years and City of Hope is in Southern California. It's in Duarte, which is sort of east of Los Angeles. Do you see a diverse patient population? If so, do you see any cultural differences with patients and families when you talk about palliative care? Uh, sure. I, I think we're lucky in the sense that we do have a very diverse population and therefore, you know, for most clinical trials, 
um, were designated as kind of a, a, a diversity site, you know, uh, for, wow. uh, you know, trials. Uh, that's really uh, has to do with kind of our catchment area. So, so, so our catchment yeah. area is unique in the sense that, uh, like you said, we're in the eastern side of Los Angeles. We're in the San Gabriel Valley uh, area, which has a very large uh, Asian population. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have a, a very large, you know, Hispanic population uh, around the Dorte area as well. Uh, in, in addition to uh, African American population um, as well. So, so we we have that good mix of individuals, um, and I think as a result of that I, I do agree. We we do see some, you know minor differences in terms of kind of cultural approaches. So, you know, uh, speaking uh, a little bit from the um, Asian, uh, you know, kind of cultural background, um, usually uh, I would say uh, in most Asian families, if you know them, uh, they don't like to talk about the disease, uh, you know, from the beginning in terms of what the outcome is. Uh, essentially, they don't want to know what you know, ultimately, let, let's say what the median survival is, what, what is that? Because they feel that um, no one knows and everything. Right. Uh, and and they, they they don't want to confront it, uh, you know, from, from, from the beginning. And they don't want to look at the numbers. Um, so I think, you know, going into that group and everything, we definitely don't talk as much about the numbers uh, from the very beginning. Um, and they really are a group that tends to, I, I would say, prioritize survival uh, mm -hmm. above, you know, other measures and everything. Uh, but then when you look at that, you know, from other cultures and everything, um, they might prioritize other things besides survival. And, and I think that's really where kind of that discussion, uh, you know, kind of comes in with every single patient to, to, to really kind of individualize Kind of you know treatments uh, uh, decisions because I, I would say even on a cultural basis uh, there are differences in terms of what potential patient preferences will be. Yeah, wow, um, that must be so difficult to navigate. Um, I, I want to ask you this one last question before we go to the Q and A and bring all of you to the stage. What does shared dis decision making mean to you? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I've always been a very honest and, uh, you know, frank individual. I think everyone. I know, that that's why I like me, you. <laughs> everyone that knows me in the HSC community <laughs> understands that. Um, so, you know, I, I think the, 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 the idea of shared decision making is un unfortunately somewhat of a made up idea uh, by, uh, you know, wh whether it's, you know, healthcare agencies, whatnot. And, and this really started in, in terms of the history of healthcare, right? So, so if we look at it, you know, back, let's say 80 or 100 years ago, uh, healthcare was very paternalistic in the sense that a doctor made a recommendation, that's what you did, um, no matter what. Uh, and then there was a shift in terms of trying to do more kind of, uh, you know, patient centered care and everything. And this is where the idea of, you know, kind of patient uh, shared decision making kind of came in and was advertised more and more. Um, but I think that while patient centered care is absolutely important, uh, and I completely support that, healthcare industry in general has kind of gone a little bit past and, and gone way too far, in my opinion, in terms of the pendulum. So that usually when I am actually a caregiver for my own family members and I'm on the other side, we go to doctor's visits and, and usually the, 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 the visit will be, hey, here are three options. Why don't you choose uh, what you want to do? There is no way that any patient or any caregiver has the knowledge or experience to confidently choose what is best you know for them at that moment in time so that's not fair to the patient that that, that, that is not shared decision making so what i think we try to do is that we discuss different options but at the end of the day i always try to make a rec a clear-cut recommendation saying that i would advise you to do this for this reason and then have a discussion with the patient and says says, does that ultimately align with your goals and with your preferences and everything, and then make that decision together so that it's not all being placed back 
on the patient as well as their families. Because honestly, I, I don't believe that they can make a shared decision uh, in that manner. And, and it's just not right for them. Yeah, and I, I totally agree. And Allison, would you begin bringing all the panelists back to the stage? And I just want to share this story to sort of illustrate your point that even healthcare professionals, people who might understand the jargon and terminology, um, don't really know what to do when all it's just thrown at them like that. Like you said, it kind of swung the opposite way. Here are your choices. Which one do you want to do? And um, I, I know I know an oncologist who treats lymphoma and then was diagnosed with lymphoma himself. And he said he really did not understand the patient experience at all until he was a patient. And all of a sudden he realized, and he said he was in a fog for a week. And, and, he, and he knew exactly what to do. He knew what his options were, but he just couldn't even really think about it. And he, he said he finally understood, you know, what was going on when he was talking about treatments with his patients and, and giving them these array of options and saying, which one would you like? And, and he finally got it. Um, but he had to become a patient first before he, he got it. So um, we have all of our panelists back and we, um, we're running a little short on time. So I do want to bring up the very first question and um, I want to kind of minimize my myself if I can. Let's see. There we go. Um, uh, this is a really broad question, guys. <laughs> so this is for all of you. Um, how can doctors become better at tough conversations? Anyone who wants to take that, I know it's a tough one. It's broad. <laughs> I can I can start taking it. Um, I think the first is that, um, and few people made this point. It, it may not be the doctor having the tough conversation in many cases, or we don't necessarily need to rely. As as only on doctors as part of an interprofessional team, so I think it's important to understand what our skill sets are. Um, and also on that note, there are actually communication skills programs for physicians, which if people want to invest in um, their time, something called Vital Talk is one that I would recommend for people. But generally speaking, as we know, it's going to be a little bit of a dance. Um, sometimes it's just about getting the information out of a physician that you want to hear. And so I'll just one thing that came to mind when I saw that question is maybe thinking about some questions that a patient might have for a physician specifically that might get to that information. So one thing that um, one communication skill we talk about is how to address, how to share um, prognosis, like what to expect when things are uncertain. So one thing, one way you can consider doing that is asking about best case situations and worst case situations. Hmm. And so instead of just thinking about the most optimistic outcome is, is thinking about the whole range of things that could happen. So if a, if a physician says that to you, that's great and can give you a little bit of clarity about what to expect. But if maybe a physician doesn't say that to you, you can ask, um, tell me a little bit about what the best case could look like, draw it for, out for me and what the worst case could look like and draw it out for me. And maybe that can give a little bit more information um, on the other end to a patient. So that's one tidbit I would just share with you. Sarah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think I can speak to this from both sides, you know, and I'll, I think that to me, um, as a physician, having a difficult conversation with a family, I don't think should ever feel like a routine. Like I would say, um, it never does for me. I think before I have those conversations with families, you know, which for in my work are pretty much on a daily basis, like I am... I'm very, I'm thinking about trying to see the, where the family is, trying to understand where they're coming from. I'll ask questions to get to that point. Um, but I've been on this side of it, I've done it for, you know, over 20 years and I would say it's never gotten easier and I don't think it should. Um, I think from a, on the other side of it, I would say that um, I thought my dad's primary care physician did the best job of delivering the the news to him, I would say that I was shocked and, or I would, I was I, not shocked. I was, there was a couple moments when my dad was having his first and second opinion where I was like, oh, you could have, mm. like you just <laughs> missed a moment there. And like, you missed what my dad was asking. You, you're not reading it right. Um, I would say listening to what my mom and dad shared later, it is overwhelming to go from living a life that is completely independent and autonomous and doing what you want to do to all of a sudden being faced with 
as all of you have discussed, these overwhelming options. And uh, so I think space and not always filling it with um, facts and statistics, sometimes it's just letting, sitting in the silence to let people process that information. And a colleague, a mentor of mine once told me, when you give information, you should wait for eight. And in my mind, sometimes I'll count to eight before I say something, because if I say something, that's for me, that's not for the family and that's not for the patient. Um, and I, I imagine all of you on this phone call do that. Um, but I think that uh, around this event do that, but um, it's a very humbling space to be in on both sides. We have another question I'm going to jump to because of time and I'm going to start with Dr. Lee and then go to Ryan. Um, how do cultural differences impact the conversations about palliative care? So I, I think it's, um, you know, as I mentioned, it, it, it's understanding who, who who you're talking to and, you know, what uh, is important in, in their culture and everything. Um, uh, and uh, uh, like I mentioned, you know, for a lot of our uh, patients that we see kind of in the San, San Gabriel Valley from the Asian culture and everything. So they they. they they don't, they absolutely uh, will not want to talk about specifically about hospice um, uh, in the very beginning. So, so, so we don't uh, really go to that and everything because we understand that that is that cultural background. When they're ready for hospice, uh, they will let us know and everything and to, to, to understand that. Um, so we focus on, we have no problem in terms of you know, uh, providing palliative care and everything um, and, and providing that, like I said, in for, from a supportive care uh, model and everything. And I think each cultures can identify different things uh, for, for what they are rather than just, you know, kind of pure terminologies and everything. Um, so, so, you know, supportive care is really kind of palliative care and everything, uh, you know, for, for those patients and helping them, you know, control the symptoms. But by just changing the wording a little bit, that they, they will be, you know, more receptive you know, to that as well and, and get an understanding of their own uh, cultural backgrounds. And Ryan, I'm, I'm going to take the question off your face so you can answer. You started your career in Kentucky. Now you're in Minnesota. Um, what about you? What, how do cultural differences impact those conversations about palliative care? Yeah, I mean, I think that they are central to these conversations because it's a lot of what, um, of what, of who people are. Yeah. And I would say the point I want to make is this is why diversity in the workforce is so important because there's only so much experience that I bring to the table when I'm working with a patient. And that's why we need a whole broad breadth of people involved in healthcare so that patients can see themselves on the other side of the desk or in the chair. Um, and so I know at the university, we're doing a lot of work to try and recruit um, a lot of uh, diverse students into our programs. But um, I think I can do the best I can at trying to meet the patient where they are and try to understand where they're coming from. But it's no substitute to, to actually seeing somebody who looks like you and, and comes from where you come from um, in the other, on the other side of the, the desk. What I think is really fascinating about HCC specifically is it attracts a very diverse group of healthcare providers. It's it's really incredible. And so I feel like we're very fortunate in that respect. Um, and speaking of that, I just want to remind everybody to please do the second poll. We've got about three minutes left. Um, the second poll is what is your relationship to HCC, HCC, whether you're a patient, caregiver, survivor, caregiver of, of a loved one, medical provider, or other. We would love to know. So we're going to leave that poll up. And just to wrap up, um, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Patel, Dr. Lee, Sarah, and Ryan for their time today. Um, this is a hard topic, uh, and it's, it's one that we absolutely have to talk about. This is also our last workshop of the year, and so we want to thank uh, not only the sponsor of this specific workshop, Genentech, but all the sponsors for this year's The Truth About Liver Cancer Program. They include AstraZeneca, Azi, Exelixis, Genentech, and Merck. Um, also, um, it is that time of year where there's usually a lot of giving. 
and you will see a big green button, button, whether you're watching this live or watching the replay, and it says support Blue Fairy. Uh, nonprofit organizations like Blue Fairy cannot exist on air. We need all the help we can get. So if you're watching this later, please click that green button to support Blue Fairy and give us a donation. You can do it one time, monthly, quarterly, yearly, um, and also uh, check to see if your company provides a matching gift. Um, again, I want to thank all of you today. You've been amazing. I want to thank our backstage manager, Allison, who's our program specialist, um, and everybody who participated. And if you are watching the replay, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook, and you have very specific questions, um, just tag me, let me know, and I'll make sure your questions get answered. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Bye-bye. Okay, thanks. Yep.